Yeah, so uh, thank you, first of all, for inviting me to this uh, mini talk series. Quite excited about it. Um, this is our latest work that, uh, of course, was a collaboration between different universities. As you already said, I'm from the University of Gothenburg, um, but this was a collaborative work also with the Heinrich Heine University in Düsseldorf, Germany, and also the Technical University in Darmstadt, which is also in Germany. Um, since there are very few of you here, I would say uh, we can make it quite interactive in a sense like you don't have to wait to ask your question until the end of the talk. Um, so please feel free to interrupt me, unmute your microphone because I will not be able to look at the chat. Maybe you can help me with that. Um, but uh, yeah, just unmute yourself, ask the question right away. So uh, we're quite a few people only, so um, we can have it interactive. Uh, so as I said, um, I will talk about active tropoids. Um, so this is kind of like a word that we came up. It's like a portmanteau of the words troplet and colloids, because this is kind of what we observed in that new type of superstructure, which self-assembled and is feedback driven. All right, let's give me a little bit of uh, feedback uh, uh, input on the, the background. So um, typically when people are talking about active matter systems um, and uh, they, they typically don't look much at the interaction of the environment and the, the active uh, agents. But you can see that uh, if you just have active particles like these hermatides here, which is basically kind of like a Janus particle, um, you can get these uh, spatial temporal structures. And uh, not only uh, synthetic uh, materials can uh, generate these structures, but also like um, natural agents, like for instance, bacteria, you can see that um, down there below. But you can also observe similar structures for droplets actually, and it has been observed in cells, especially the nucleolus is an example of a droplet inside a droplet, and they can create these spatial trample structures, but also droplets have been shown to become active due to some internal convection mechanism and therefore become motile. Now, the question was a bit, um, how can we combine those two types of systems? How can we combine droplets and colloids? And uh, people have been shown that by taking, for instance, like this oil droplets and uh, on their interface, they put uh, colloidal particles. And you can see that uh, on the surface, on the interface uh, of the, the, the droplet to its environment, you can have these colloidal superstructures. And uh, you can even have um, through internal mechanisms, these or like bacteria inside a droplet, as you see below, um, motility. Um, what all of these systems um, have in common though, is that uh, the environment serves as a continuous free energy source, right? So which can also mediate the, the in effective interactions between the different type of active agents that you have uh, whether there are hydrodynamic interactions or interactions based on visual perception, acoustic signals, or even chemical fields. Um, but they, they, these examples all, they do not show typically the intrinsic dynamics that uh, adapt to the dynamics of the active agents. So uh, what I want to go to is basically, um, we want to understand is how is there, can there be a feedback mechanism between an environment on the left and the active agents on the right? I've shown a couple of examples here. And uh, typically people have looked at how the environment influences those active agents, how they self-assemble, uh, et cetera. But typically the other way around has not been observed and uh, had a special look at. And that's exactly where we started our work. We wanted to understand is how can a feedback cycle between the environment and an active agent be created? And uh, we looked at a, a model system for this. So we also use colloids, these are micro scale colloids, um, but the same could be in principle done for nanoscale objects as well. Um, so you see here kind of like the side view and we have two types of uh, colloids. Um, the, the red ones are light absorbing and then we have also light non-absorbing particles and they're basically sandwiched between uh, two cover glasses um, so they can't stack in uh, 3D, they can only stay in 2D. And what happens is, is if you put on light, they're inside a mixture and uh, they create um, this uh, temperature and also uh, in the end concentration gradients, which generates these flows inside a cell, which are enhanced by the boundary itself. And therefore they create um, a self-assembly. So you say the non-absorbing ones, they come together um, close to an, a light absorbing one. 
And the reason why is because we're using a critical binary mixture here in this case, um, which phase separates at a given temperature and concentration. You can see the phase diagram here. Um, and in principle, you have uh, the colored region and the white region, and they differentiate by being demixed and mixed. Yeah, so you have, in this case, water and an oil-like substance, which is called lutidine. Um, what is important is that at a certain temperature, they can go into a demixed state. It means water and lutidine separate from each other, but they can also mix again below the temperature. And the, the dark gray area you can see on the left and right um, is um, kind of like an off-critical situation. And uh, there you get uh, liquid droplets that occur. And uh, depending on which side of the diagram you are, on the right, you get water-rich droplets. On the left, you get lutidine-rich droplets, as you can see here in this um, couple of snapshots. And uh, in our case, we'll focus on the right side of the diagram because we had hydrophilic particles, which means they want to be inside that droplet as well. I'm going to show you like now the, the experiment that, uh, that we saw and uh, I'm going to go through step by step as we don't have to understand it um, uh, completely um, at the moment. But uh, so we, what we have is this binary mixtures of uh, passive and uh, colloids. So they are light absorbing and non-absorbing. The light absorbing ones are the dark ones you can see and the uh, non-absorbing ones are the light ones. And if I start a video now that uh, at the moment the video starts, the light is being switched on and you see that these uh, particles come together, they form colloidal molecules. And at the end, the uh, droplets appear around them and uh, these are quite active. So you see that the colloidal molecules actually move and that moves the droplet as well. So this is the new types of structures that we observe. But as I said, let's take a step back and understand actually uh, the active colloidal molecules first. So if we, if we look at them, um, you can see that in this video, as soon as the light is being switched on, those two species come together and they form a Janus dimer. So out of a uh, absorbing and non-absorbing particle that breaks the radial symmetry of the absorbing particle, and then it generates motility uh, through that uh, concentration gradient that it uh, generates by having just uh, an increased temperature, which leads to uh, local demixing. And this local demixing is now the representative of our environment, as we've seen before. And then we have the Janus dimer on the right. And what we clearly observe here is that, of course, the environment influences and actually makes this Janus dimer possible in the first place. Um, in our previous paper before this, um, we actually looked at these kind of active colloidal molecules. We classified them into different categories. So you, depending on the, the constellation of uh, absorbing and non-absorbing particles, you get uh, migrators, which were particles that mostly propel. Then you get also static ones that happens when you get you know, radial symmetry again, because they, they get completely around one absorbing particle, for instance, or you can get also spinners and also rotators. Yeah. If you go now continue with the video, uh, what we saw already before is we had uh, these, these droplets that start to appear around the colloidal molecules. And as you can see very nicely, as these colloidal molecules are still very active in the propellant space, they actually move the droplet with it. Over time, then multiple droploids actually merge together into uh, a single one. And if you would play the video even longer, you would see that you have in your point of view in your microscope only a single huge uh, droplet in which the colloidal molecules are all immersed. If we have now a look at the, the, this, this simple schematic again, then you have again the local demixing uh, as the environment on the left and the passive colloids as the active agents on the right. And you can clearly see that again, of course, here in this case, as it did for the active colloidal molecules, um, they, they are responsible for the aggregation of the molecules in the first place, but they also provide a confinement because now these these um, particles, they cannot leave the droplet. So that is kind of like the boundary that they're in. But on the other hand, the, the colloids, they give the, the, the droplet a structure because depending on their constellation, uh, it can be active or non-active, but they also give the droplet the motility. And as I said, you know, as the colloid molecule moves, it demix the area around it. Therefore, the droplet is also growing and uh, moving with the colloidal molecules. And all of that is, uh, of course, light induced. Yeah, that means uh, we can, uh, this process is completely reversible. If we switch off the light, those molecules break apart, the droplets uh, disappear by just remixing again. Um, and so we can do that on and off. And we should show that at the end that this is actually possible. 
Now we did also not just experiments, but it's actually my uh, the collaboration with uh, Düsseldorf and Darmstadt. They they did the, the simulations to that, and they were actually the reason why we started to understand the process happening in our uh, experiments. So again, uh, just a couple of snapshots here um, that we see over time. So we start again with the binary colloids. We also do that in the simulations, and then over time we see the active colloidal molecules occurring. Um, and very nicely, actually, in the simulations, we're actually able to see um, the, the, the droplet around it in terms of the, the blue concentration, which is water. So an increased, uh, the darker the blue, the more water content there is. Whereas in experiments, we just see the interface of the droplet. And then we see also in the simulations that over time, these droplets, droploids uh, grow and fuse together. Now, using the simulations, what we can also do is and I'll draw a full phase diagram of our emerging structures. You already see that we saw two of them or three of them. Um, here you have um, the, the, the full phase diagram. Um, you can already see it kind of resembles the phase diagram of the critical mixture that we have in, as a suspension. And I'll show you that here again. So it's basically um, on the, the energy input, the y-axis of our phase diagram on the left. Um, is basically the temperature in our phase diagram of the critical mixture. So that is basically the value lambda, which just means that the energy input you know, depends on uh, the, the intensity of the light source. It depends on the absorption properties of the particles and how many absorbing particles are there locally to then um, increase it to a certain local temperature. On the other hand, uh, we also look at the relative concentration, which is basically just a concentration away from the critical point. Um, which is then our x-axis. And uh, so we, we put now our uh, experiment values on top of that. And uh, of course, in simulations, that's easier to do. So we have the full picture here, but we can also show that in experiments, we see uh, similar structures appearing at the same spots. Uh, these are the red, uh, red markers that we put there. So it coincides very nicely. And uh, so you already see that we have four phases there. So first is what we call a disordered phase, which is just this uh, mixture of uh, two species of particles. Then the second is a bit closer towards the critical point to the center on the left um, is where we have active colloidal molecules appearing. Then uh, we have the, the active droploids in, uh, in green. This is the one we saw. And interestingly, if you go even higher in temperature, uh, at some point, what happens is that uh, these colloidal molecules separate from each other into the two species, and you see that non-absorbing particles actually go to the interface and kind of form like a Pickering emulsion solution. And the reason for that, again, is something we could have a look in simulations is if you look at the active droploids, you see that the gradient close to the interface of the droplet is quite shallow. Um, and so, so the active colloid molecules are still um, keeping together. Whereas if you increase that concentration, you get a very sharp uh, transition at the interface. It just means that you increase the water content inside your droplet is that uh, the, the non-absorbing particles are actually just weakly hydrophilic, hydrophilic. And that means they like to go energy-wise towards the interface to counteract that. Now, we could also use these simulations to get a bit more the quantitative results that we have so far shown just the qualitative results. And uh, so, for instance, one thing that we want to look at is basically the droplet size over time. How do they grow, basically, understand their growth behavior? And you see the, the simulations is the, the green curve. And then you have in the background, you have the experiments, and they quite well agree, and you get a temperature, uh, sorry, a time coefficient around 0 0.41, 42. So that corresponds very well. Um, that is for the active droplets case. If you compare that to immotile droplets, the ones that, you know, where there are no colloidal molecules inside, but just the absorbing ones remain, the absolutely non-absorbing ones go to the interface. Um, then you get a growth behavior, which is much slower, which is between the 0 0.31 and 35. And that is, of course, uh, reasonable because if you have, um, in the active case, you have a party of colloidal molecules and droplets actually coming together to form um, a bigger droplet. They fuse together much faster compared to an immotile one, which is only due to diffusion uh, from its surrounding is starting to grow. And therefore, we see this lower coefficient. Interestingly, uh, this uh, droplet formation happens, you know, not, not immediately, 
um, but it happens for a certain delay. Um, it, it depends a bit on the intensity, but you can see it's around eight seconds, which just means that uh, the system needs to heat up locally first to overcome this energy barrier that is in the phase diagram um, and then go actually into the demixing. On the other hand, we can look at droplet velocities and uh, you would expect to go uh, higher and higher uh, as you increase the energy because you increase basically the gradient, either it's a temperature or a concentration gradient, and therefore the particles would be driven faster. But interestingly, we see that after some peak, it goes down again. And this is exactly the transition between uh, from one phase to another, from active droploids to immotile droploids. And we can quantify that also differently by basically looking at number of non-absorbing particles being at the interface of the droplet. And you see that, of course, at some point you have very few, um, you see in simulations and experiments, uh, very few non-absorbing particles at the interface and that increases with your energy input and therefore um, the, the droplet velocity goes down because basically the droplet becomes uh, passive again. And you see also that uh, the, the base, the standard velocity is around one micrometer per second. So these are not the fastest. Now, why were we actually able to, to measure that? Let's have a look at the original unedited videos. So far, I've shown you videos that were actually contrast enhanced. So you can actually see very nicely the droplets and the particles. If you look at the original raw images, you see that it's quite difficult to actually quantify the droplets. Um, you can do that by eye, um, but you already see it would be very difficult if you use standard methods for particle tracking, which is usually based on thresholding or radial symmetry or similar things. Uh, it's easy to track the particles itself, but it's very difficult to track uh, the droplets because you see um, that you can only recognize them really by the interface. So for that, uh, my colleagues at the University of Gothenburg uh, they actually develop a new machine learning algorithm that is able to actually extract quantitative data from our droplets, such as you know the center of mass position. So we can use that for the velocity, but we can also drag its area, its size, its shape, etc. There's a lot of information we can extract just from tracking them. And uh, this is kind of like how it looks in the end. I'm going to show you uh, a video now. Um, so you see that uh, you can already start tracking those droplets when they're barely bigger than the particle itself. And then as they grow um, and uh, fuse together, the colors change, which just shows that it's a different droplet that is now larger. And uh, we are able now to track each individual droplet as it grows. It still involves a lot of manual labor at the end to actually characterize them and label them correctly. But uh, you already have now a method that uh, manifests that, uh, that droplet. Uh, the way we did it is just very quickly. I'm not an expert in machine learning algorithms, but you basically use a unit. So you start with an image of those particles. On the left, you see uh, it's quite difficult to track. You barely see the interface. And if you look at the background, actually, you see that the intensity is very inhomogeneous. So that makes it very difficult for standard tracking mechanisms. But in the end, what you see as an output is basically this intensity um, where you can then have the droplet and uh, its shape and so forth. Now at the end, I wanna show you two, two other things that we saw in this new type of system. Uh, on the left hand, I'll show you what we call explosive droplets, which are very delayed droplet formation process. I've talked about that and uh, this little inset before that there's a delay happening, but here this delay is very huge. And uh, which means that uh, if you need to cross a huge energy barrier, so you need a lot of heat to be generated in the first place. And then you see that suddenly in experiments and simulations, this, this droplet is starting to explode and it has increased to a, a very uh, large size in a very short amount of time. On the other hand, we can use uh, periodic illumination, which just means we switch, switch on the light and uh, switch it off again and uh, to limit the growth of those, those um, droploids. And I show you that, um, so, so in experiments, of course, we switch off the light, you can't see anything anymore, it's black, but uh, in simulations actually quite nicely, you can see the structure still, you can still track them. Um, and you see that, you know, the, the blue bubbles recognize or characterizing the droplets uh, are still there and they, they keep the same size over time. And uh, with that, I uh, want to summarize my, my presentation. So uh, I showed you that there is uh, very importantly a two-way feedback that creates these active droploids that is induced 
um, by light. And uh, we've done experiments and simulations that allowed us to gain uh, new insights into their formation process. And uh, this then could open new possibilities for light activated biomimetic materials, because as I've shown in the beginning, cells have a very similar process um, of doing that. Um, of course, there's a simplified mechanism, but one could draw some parallels to that. And uh, with that, I want to uh, thank my uh, collaborators uh, that did the theory and the simulations and the machine learning algorithms. Uh, the publication you can find on the big QR code, which was just recently uh, published in Nature Communications. Um, if you're more interested in like how this uh, research actually occurred, more on a personal side, uh, how difficult it was to set up the experiments, et cetera, you can read the behind the paper story also published in the Nature portfolio with the, the smaller QR code. And um, with that, I want to thank you for your attention and I'm happy to.